Today we're checking out trivia for games with an extra dimension. That's right, we're talking about secrets and easter eggs for Nintendo 3DS titles. If there's one thing that gaming struggled with before the 3DS, it was making stereoscopic 3D a viable option. You either had to make substantial practical and technical compromises as with the Virtual Boy, or be willing to throw down literally thousands of dollars on a 3D screen. And yet, despite this great selling point and clear advantage, some of the arguably best games on the 3DS weren't all that 3D. In fact, the first game we're talking about is all about becoming 2D, The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds. The game actually had some pretty noticeable differences between regions, some of which have been documented by professional translator Clyde Mandolin on his website Legends of Localization. One of these changes tells us a little about the perception of body image around the world. In the Japanese version of the game, the Zora Queen Smooth Gem is not the source of her power. In this version, the gem is actually the secret to her beauty, and when it goes missing, she becomes fat. After the gem is stolen in the Japanese version of the game, one of the Zora in Zora's domain says he's fond of the queen being fat, but in the US release, he just says that they have to get the gem back. When the player gets the gem back to Oren, that same Zora will be disappointed that Oren becomes slim again. Another Zora also mentions the queen's beauty returning when she becomes skinny again. After completing the House of Gales, Azora says that he was swimming with the queen, but that he couldn't keep up. He implies that he lost her because she was so slim, reinforcing the idea that her losing weight has improved her. These references to beauty and body weight were all cut in the North American version of the game. It's no secret that Nintendo of America has slightly more strict guidelines for its localizers than the developers have back in Japan. Over the years, it seems NOA have become more aware of issues relating to weight and body image. After all, it wasn't too long ago that Nintendo came under fire for calling a 10-year-old girl fat in Wii Fit. The company probably wanted to avoid a repeat of this controversy, and take a more responsible approach that didn't tie Queen Oren's worth to her physical appearance. Another popular 3DS Zelda release came in the remake of Majora's Mask. The game made some interesting changes over the original N64 release, adding many noticeable differences like updated models and streamlined gameplay. But it also added a few features that can't normally be seen. In the original N64 version, the Moon Children never show their faces, something that the developers no doubt had planned, as they didn't bother to texture under the children's masks, resulting in faceless character models. It's possible that this could have been to save space, but the savings would have been extremely small, making it a bit doubtful. When it comes to the 3DS release, however, it seems the developers decided to go the extra mile and give the children faces, though these are not visible in-game and can only be seen by reverse engineering the game's files. Rather than creating a brand new face for the children, however, the developers decided that the children should all share the same face as the title's happy mask salesman. It's not clear if there is a great reason for this, or if it's just a little easter egg. One of Nintendo's other blockbuster franchises, Super Mario, also got a lot of love on the 3DS. Super Mario 3D Land took the two different branches of the Mario franchise, 2D and 3D, and crammed them together to make a new type of Super Mario title. But of course, it kept a lot of the old standards, like the series Goombas. Speaking of which, the YouTuber SwankyBox discovered a strange oddity within the game's first stage when experimenting with how many Goombas could be killed in a single ground pound. It was discovered that a cheap cheap can do damage to a Goomba that is within or has previously been part of a stack. However, it can't harm a solo Goomba that was never stacked, nor any other enemy. With this in mind, Swanky tried out other Goomba types to see how they would interact with Cheep Cheeps. When introducing a giant tailed Goomba into the first stage, the Goomba would instantly leap a considerable distance off screen, then swipe its tail while out of view. Everything on screen would then take damage, and Mario would warp across the scene, and the giant tailed Goomba would then die. While continuing to experiment, when moving it to a new location, when the giant tailed Goomba attacked, not only did everything on camera take damage, but it would also, for some bizarre reason, make almost everything on screen completely disappear. This includes all stage elements, the HUD, and even Mario himself. This resulted in the inability to even quit the stage, likely as it considers Mario to not be touching the ground, which prevents players from leaving the level when paused. Another Mario game which takes yet another different form is the RPG subseries Mario & Luigi. Specifically, Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr's Journey. If you guys actually bought this remake, you may find that you're part of a very small minority. 
Nintendo decided to remake Bowser's Inside Story, which was originally released on the DS, after their success of the 3DS remake of Mario & Luigi's Superstar Saga. Interestingly, the development team said they actually remade this game for the 3DS instead of Nintendo Switch due to timing, but also wanted to retain the dual screen aspect of the original release. They also mentioned that they skipped remaking Partners in Time as they only wanted to focus on the most well-received games in the series. Though many reviews for the Bowser's Inside Story remake were positive, the game is actually not just one of the worst selling titles in the Mario & Luigi series, but even one of the worst selling Mario games of all time. The game's launch was so poor that it's only beaten in its abysmal sales by the games released for the Virtual Boy. This is in direct contrast to the original Bowser's Inside Story, which remains the best-selling release for the Mario & Luigi subseries. In Japan, the remake sold just under 9,500 units in its first week, with Famitsu's sales tracker reporting under 35,000 copies sold in its lifetime. If that number doesn't mean anything to you, let us put it in perspective. This remake failed to sell so much that it actually sold over 18 times worse than the Virtual Boy console did in Japan. Shortly after the remake's release, Alpha Dream filed for bankruptcy, closing down entirely. Though it's never been directly stated, it's generally believed that the remake's poor sales resulted in the closure of a company that produced some of the most respected RPGs in Nintendo history. From one Mario title to kind of another but not quite, Puzzle & Dragon Z Super Mario Bros. Edition was a pretty strange two-for-one offering, which unsurprisingly combined the Mario series with the Puzzle & Dragon series, a game that at one time seemed set to take over the gaming space with some serious force. And as with most popular games, it has some noteworthy curiosities hidden within. One thing that caught our eyes while exploring the game's files is that it's possible to find a rather bizarre unused graphic where most of the graphics for the game's monsters are found. The image is unlike any other in the game, and it's actually a photograph rather than drawn artwork. The image depicts a man wearing rather fetching purple garb, clutching a staff donning the head of a rather happy dragon considering his decapitation. This photo is likely a member of the game's staff and would have been used as a placeholder. Another surprise hit on the platform was Fire Emblem Awakening, which proved that Nintendo was wrong to assume Western audiences couldn't get on board with story-driven tactical RPGs. Fire Emblem is a pretty complex franchise, strewn with references to classical mythology. From Greek to Roman to Norse, each game references myths and legends within its locations, classes, and even characters. These nods are as prominent during development as they are in the finished product, as seen with Fire Emblem Awakening's Priam. Anyone familiar with Homer's epic poem The Iliad will immediately clock the name, which the character shares with its benevolent ruler of Troy, who stood against Agamemnon in the Trojan War. Moreover, Priam is otherwise known as Paris in the Japanese version of Awakening, another Homeric reference to King Priam's foolhardy son. While these names may seem like they've been chosen at random on the face of it, they're apt once you consider the character's backstory. Fire Emblem's Priam claims to be a descendant of a fan favorite Ike, the protagonist of Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. In terms of the game's lore, Ike had ascended to legend in his own right, elevated by divine power and granted with the title of the Radiant Hero. It makes sense that the character claiming to be descended from divine heroes would be given the name of a mythological prince, and yet the two couldn't be more different. Homer's Paris incited the war on Troy and is portrayed as a coward deeply unskilled in close combat. Fire Emblem's Priam, however, is a seasoned warrior, disciplined to a fault, and rejects the offer of recruitment unless the player can defeat him and his band of mercenaries. We can't know for sure, but perhaps the name was changed from Paris to Priam in the localization so that he could share a name with a Homeric figure with a more honorable cultural standing. Presumably, the ideal substitute would have been the name of Priam's older, wiser son, Hector, but the name had already been given to another beloved Fire Emblem protagonist years earlier. Today, we'll be looking at a selection of fun Nintendo Easter eggs, so let's jump straight in. First up, we're looking at a bizarre ghostly Easter egg found in Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. The team behind the Mario series seem to enjoy putting unexplainable creepy extras into their games, just for those who like to wait around. In Episode 1, Level 16, Dodgy Doors at Boo Mansion, an easter egg can be found with some patience. In order to reveal this secret, the player must wait a surprisingly long time considering the short and simple nature of the level. 
Towards the back of the house, the player will come across three movable boxes with doors. Waiting by these doors for a full five minutes will reveal a ghostly set of handprints against the wall. What's interesting about these handprints is that they aren't positioned in the same place each time they spawn in, and are randomly placed within this area. Other Mario games have secrets even harder to find than this. Interplay's Mario Teaches Typing, released for DOS in 1991, has its own hidden secret. This time, though, the easter egg is tucked away within the code of the game. By exploring the hex code of the game's executable file, mario.exe, some hidden ASCII art of Mario's head can be found. Secrets can be found buried in the code of other Nintendo games as well. In Donkey Kong Land for the original Game Boy, a string in the code of both the Japanese and English releases reads P. Floyd. The string is used to verify save game data on the cartridge. The P. Floyd string has to be present in three different areas of the game's code for the files to function, and if the string is missing, the game will simply erase the data. This string is a reference to the English rock band Pink Floyd. As the game was created by Rare, a British studio, it's unsurprising to see them pay tribute to such an influential English band. Nintendo aren't afraid to reference their own games either. The Japanese version of Paper Mario has an interesting reference to another Nintendo title. A toad can be found in the Toad Town Garden with an infatuation for flowers. In the North American version of the game, this character is called Min T, but their name was originally Lip in the Japanese game. This is in reference to a Nintendo character of the same name from Panel Dipon on the Super Famicom, which was released as Tetris Attack internationally. Panel Dipon's Lip is a flower fairy, and both characters have a love for flowers while also sharing the same color palette of pink, yellow, and green. Nintendo games seem to have fun with character names, such as with the name of Porky's father in the English translation of Earthbound, known as Aloysius. Marcus Lindblom, the director of the game's English localization, needed to decide on a name for the character. He settled with the name Aloysius, taken from Episode 75, Beanstalk Bunny, of the Daffy Duck cartoon. Daffy takes the name to avoid being mistaken for Jack in the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. He is Jack. It's a lie! It's a lie! Uh, my name is, uh, Aloysius! Lindblom chose this name as he thought it was both dumb and funny. The name Aloysius was also used by Warner Brothers for the full name of Daffy's alter ego, Duck Edgar Dumas Aloysius Eohan Dodges. Though it's not confirmed to actually be the character, the Japanese-exclusive Famicom Wars makes reference to another of Nintendo's own series, Metroid. Donut Island's Red Star Commander is named Samasun, and her portrait is shown to be the helmet of Samus Aran. However, when looking at the full character sprite, the helmet seems to be the only similarity. This is actually one of the earliest recognized appearances or reference to Samus in anything other than the first release of Metroid itself on the NES. From a single cameo appearance to a game all about other games appearing together in one place. During the village's final smash attack in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, Tom Nook will appear and throw a vast array of furniture from the Animal Crossing series into the fighter's new building. There's also a chance that he'll even throw a Triforce from the Zelda series into the house. Another beloved sci-fi series is Nintendo's Metroid franchise. Although the series has many on-the-nose references to things like the Alien movies, there's a few obscure nods to other products. The planet SR388 was the home of the Metroid race, and was the setting for Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Its name may seem like a bunch of random characters, but these letters and numbers do have meaning to them. According to Samus's character designer Hiroji Kiyotake, SR388 gets its name from the popular Yamaha SR400 series motorcycle engine. Although the engines were branded SR400cc, they actually have a slightly smaller capacity of 388cc, and so the team incorporated its true specs into the name. Controversy and Nintendo often go hand in hand, as can be seen with the 2009 case of Nintendo vs James Burt. James, a 24-year-old Australian, had uploaded a copy of New Super Mario Bros Wii to a file-sharing network prior to the game's official release in Australia. After Nintendo caught wind of the situation, they pushed to receive compensation for the gamer's direct copyright infringement. In a news article on the official Nintendo Australia website, the company claimed to employ the use of sophisticated technological forensics to identify the individual responsible. The result of the lawsuit was compensation of 1.5 million Australian dollars to be paid to Nintendo by Mr. Burt. 
In a statement, Bert advised others not to repeat his actions, and that he'll be paying this debt for the rest of his life. The story doesn't end there, however, as three years after the case, Bert received a surprise phone call from his local EB Games store informing him that he had been selected by Nintendo to pick up a package from the store. Inside, he found a statue of Ganondorf, which was given away to pre-orders of the UK release of The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD. Nintendo gave no official reason to sending Bert the statue. James commented on Reddit saying, I think it's ironic that out of everyone in Australia they could have chosen, I get given the Ganon statue for being a good customer of Nintendo. I was told I was chosen from Nintendo and received it today. I'm very grateful they chose me, don't get me wrong, and I do love Nintendo even after being sued. And EB Games had no info on it, just that I won. No papers came with it, just the figure in a Nintendo brown box. Sticking with cookies, let's talk about the origins of Yoshi's Cookie. This Super Nintendo puzzle game wasn't always a part of the Mario series. While details are hazy, we can determine that the game's name was originally Hermetica. The game was first shown in 1992 at the Consumer Electronics Show. Nintendo bought the license for both the NES and Game Boy versions of Hermetica, and created Yoshi's Cookie by simply injecting Mario characters. Bulletproof Software still held the rights to their original SNES game, however, so Nintendo provided the devs with a license to use Mario characters and the Yoshi's Cookie branding. Wanting to create a fresh puzzle game, the team employed the skills of Tetris creator Alexei Pashitnov to design their levels. Evidence of this origin can be found hidden within Yoshi's Cookie on the Game Boy. A debug mode can be accessed in the game with a Game Genie. The title for this screen reads Hermetica Debug Mode in reference to the game's early development. Mario Kart has always been a fun game for children and adults alike. Mario and his friends have some heated battles and races, and taunting each other is all part of the fun. However, one character seems to have taken taunting a little too far. In Update 1.1 of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on the Switch, a gesture for the Inkling Girl was altered. The original animation involved the girl bending her arm at the elbow, gripping her bicep with the other hand, and emphatically raising her fist. This could have been interpreted as a gesture known as bras d'honneur, or Iberian slap. While the gesture isn't offensive in Japan, across some of Europe and Latin America it's akin to flipping someone off. In the update, the gesture was changed so that the Inkling girl just raised her fists to her opponent in a movement that looked more like a cheer. From one Nintendo Kart racer to another, let's talk about Diddy Kong Racing. Within the game's data are two unused characters, but the only way of accessing these in-game is by using a cheat device. The first of these unused characters is the pterodactyl seen in the Hot Top Volcano stage. Using action replay codes, players can set up a race where every character is the pterodactyl. Regardless of whether the player or AI wins these races, the You Lose jingle will play. The game may believe that a pterodactyl crossing the finish line means that the player has lost. This suggests that the player is supposed to race against it as a main character, but because the game only detects the pterodactyl crossing the finish line, it's assuming the player has lost. The pterodactyl also has an unused getting hit sound effect, which adds to the idea of there being a planned pterodactyl boss. The second character is a snowball, which follows a similar set of rules in its AI to the boos featured in Mario games. If racing as this snowball, the player is unable to move. However, computer players can proceed through the stage as long as the player is facing away from them. This means that their movement is never seen as they remain completely static when in view. The Virtual Boy has a reputation for being, generally speaking, not good. It sold poorly and had very few games. Nintendo released barely any titles from their major franchises on the system, and those that were released felt subpar. One series that had no love on the console was Metroid. However, Samus has a pretty cool appearance in the game Galactic Pinball. The Cosmic stage features a hidden bonus level. To access this stage, the player must hit their ball into the top right of the board, start the bumper clash sequence, and then break all of the bumpers. An S symbol from Super Metroid will then replace the bumpers, and the ball will transform into Samus's ship. An audio cue will say, Roger, Samus. And the Super Metroid theme will begin to play. The player must then shoot all of the on-screen enemies, including Metroids. 
Keeping with the theme of comic book related games, let's take a look at some unused content from the action RPG Marvel Ultimate Alliance. The game was developed by Raven Software, but ported to the PSP and Wii by Vicarious Visions, who are a subsidiary of Activision. To promote the Wii version of the game, someone at Activision or Vicarious Visions thought it would be a good idea to try and include Nintendo characters in the game. Both Link and Samus were put into the game, and they were demoed to Nintendo to get the company's approval and input. However, Nintendo did not approve Activision's request, and there are several ideas as to why. Firstly, the characters seem to have been demoed to Nintendo in the PlayStation 2 version of the game by a genius. This could have understandably rubbed Nintendo the wrong way, as presenting their characters on a competitor's hardware could be seen as insensitive. Some also believe it was because Activision demoed the characters to Nintendo before they had gotten approval, and it came across as presumptuous. Or it could simply be that Nintendo didn't think the game or demonstration was of a high standard and refused. According to artist Jason Harlow, Link's model was entirely finished in just a week, so this demo may have been hastily made and lacked polish. In this episode, we're going to be talking about figurines, toys, and video games. Nintendo launched their lineup of amiibo toys back in November of 2014, where they were met with a mixed but generally favorable response. Nintendo moving into the Toys to Life figurine market resulted in a huge volume of profit for the video game giant, with new amiibo continuously selling out. However, it seems that Rare had a similar idea to Amiibo back in the days of the Nintendo 64. According to Chris Seaver, creator of Conker's Bad Fur Day, Rare founders Chris and Tim Stamper wanted to do Amiibo-style things with toys during the Nintendo 64 era. Rare even made Amiibo-like figures of two characters from a cancelled Xbox 360 fantasy game called Urchin. These renders were made about nine years before Amiibo were released, but since the game was cancelled in 2006, they'll remain concept art unless Rare ever revives the project. Another popular Toys to Life game is Skylanders, a series that has divided many fans of the Spyro series. But with Skylanders Superchargers, Activision was given permission to use the likeness of both Bowser and Donkey Kong. Other Nintendo characters were also considered for cameo appearances, but ultimately they were disagreed upon. Plans for a warrior Princess Peach were put forward, but Nintendo refused the idea as it seemed out of character for Peach. This led to all other Mario characters being off-limits as well. Activision even wanted to include Kirby, who would have been able to suck up enemies and bounce around the stage. But because the rights to the character are partially owned by HAL, the team were unable to gain a license to use him. The last Nintendo character considered was Fox McCloud, who was requested for the game as the Skylanders Superchargers world has a particularly heavy focus on vehicles. However, Nintendo felt that having Fox in the game might pull interest away from their own game, Star Fox Zero, which was to launch around the same time. Speaking of Star Fox Zero, Nintendo wanted to make an R-Wing amiibo for the game that could transform. According to series developer Shigeru Miyamoto, the amiibo would have been capable of transforming between its R-Wing state and its walker state, just like in the game. Miyamoto told Game Informer, we were working on a couple of ideas for the game for well over a year. We had an R-Wing amiibo that would transform into the walker, but it was really tough to execute that in the normal amiibo size and in a way that met with product safety standards. We had to give up on it. There's also been some speculation that we didn't get an R-Wing amiibo at all due to these safety standards, as the R-Wing would have been too pointy for children to play with in a safe manner. In the 1980s, Nintendo released a series of multiplayer versus arcade machines with special versions of popular titles within their library of games. These included versus Excitebike, versus Pinball, and versus Tennis. Perhaps the rarest of these machines, however, was an obscure spin-off of their versus Stroke and Match Golf arcade game titled Versus Ladies Golf. It seems the only difference in Ladies Golf is that Nintendo swapped out the male golfer's sprite with that of a female one. Despite Nintendo's efforts, there seemed to be very little interest in the game. Versus Ladies Golf was reported very unsuccessful at the time, which contributed to its extreme rarity. This wouldn't be Nintendo's only rare arcade machine, with cabinets of Punch-Out and Super Punch-Out also proving to be quite elusive. The reason for this is due to the way the game functioned in arcades, featuring a double-screen setup. 
These cabinets follow the same specifications for Nintendo PlayChoice 10 machines, which would feature instructions on one screen and gameplay on the other. Nintendo sold a conversion kit to help arcade operators convert these old Punch-Out! series machines into PlayChoice 10 cabinets. Since these modified cabinets could store up to 10 games, they would likely draw more players. This led to many Punch-Out! cabinets being converted to increase profits, and also resulted in Punch-Out! and Super Punch-Out! machines being significantly harder to find. Nintendo was quite open to the idea of special editions back in the 80s and early 90s. In 1986, they even helped release a special edition of Super Mario Bros., which was exclusively given out to contest winners of the Japanese radio show All Night Nippon. Instead of being published by Nintendo, it seems to have been published by Fuji Television, who owned the station that broadcast the show. The game was essentially a remixed version of the original Super Mario Bros., but it also included some elements from the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, which is known as the Lost Levels in the West. Some of the game's visuals were modified to resemble celebrities from the All Night Nippon show and the Nippon Broadcasting System radio station. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Mario Paint, because I feel like we all need a break after that. During the Mario Paint title screen, the player can mess around with the letters in the Mario Paint logo to see a variety of different gags. Clicking the letter R will play the sound of what can be assumed to be a baby laughing. However, if this sound is reversed and slowed down by around 50%, we can hear a close approximation of the original Nintendo recording. Instead of a baby laughing, we can hear a voice simply saying, Nintendo. Nintendo. Today we'll be talking about video game developer office cultures. To most of us, school is something you just have to get through. You study, you make friends, well hopefully anyway, you're taught life skills to use in some sort of profession, and then it's time to move on. Goodbye regimented school life, or perhaps not. Back in 1996, a video game developer by the name of Giles Goddard became one of the first foreign, or gaijin, workers at Nintendo. During his time at the company, Goddard helped work on projects such as Super Mario 64 and 1080 snowboarding, before leaving to form his own company, Vitae, in 2002. When asked about what it was like working for Nintendo, Goddard told Source Gaming, Nintendo is a bit like a big school. You have a bell at 8.45 and a bell at 12 o'clock and another bell at 1 o'clock and then another bell at 4 or 5. You have bells throughout the day to tell you exactly what you should be doing. It's very Japanese. Furthermore, in a similar interview about the making of Super Mario 64 with Pixelatron, he says there was no talking. Occasionally, you'd get little groups of programmers or artists getting together for a chat, and somebody higher up would walk over and give them the eye, and then they'd sit down and shut up. Coincidentally, Nintendo did set up a school of sorts. During the development of New Super Mario Bros. 2, a course was put together with the intention of teaching employees from other backgrounds in the company how to make Mario games professionally. It was unofficially titled the Mario Cram School and was created by longtime video game producer Takashi Tezuka. The hope was to combat the fact that, allegedly, out of the entire development team, only the director and art director had long-term experience producing 2D Mario games. The idea paid off and actually led to several new features for New Super Mario Bros. 2 such as the nighttime levels, Dash Mario levels and two-player co-op. Today we're going to be looking at hidden easter eggs and references in Nintendo games. Gaming companies tend to have different approaches when it comes to easter eggs in their games. Some absolutely litter their games with secrets, such as Bethesda and Rockstar, while others barely include any. Although they certainly have references to their own legacy and other games, Nintendo seem to be one of the companies with few easter eggs to show. That said, easter eggs do occasionally appear in Nintendo games, as can be seen with one of their newest titles. Within Super Mario Odyssey, the player can find Hint Toad in levels after a boss has been defeated. The character offers to give Mario information on undiscovered moons for a price of 50 coins, and originally appeared in Super Mario Galaxy. But what's interesting about Hint Toad is the actual map that they're holding, as it's not a map for a level found in Mario Odyssey. The map Hint Toad consults throughout the game is actually a map of Super Mario 64's bob Battlefield. This map can even be seen in a brochure inside the Odyssey itself. 
What's also potentially exciting about this easter egg is that it may be a hint at future DLC for the game, though of course we cannot guarantee that. Moving on to another Nintendo franchise, let's take a look at The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D. The title has several bonus games within it, one of which can be played at the Town Shooting Gallery in East Clocktown. Inside the gallery, there are several items on the counter next to the gallery's owner. One of these items is actually a puzzle toy made by Nintendo in 1980, called the 10 Billion Barrel. The object of the puzzle was to rotate the barrel cylinders and slide the balls between them, in the hope of organizing all of the balls into lines of a single color. The Zelda series gets a lot of love, but a Nintendo series with perhaps an even more dedicated fan base is the Metroid franchise. The fourth game in the series, Metroid Fusion, has a few Easter eggs. This includes a hidden GameCube early on in the game that can be found among some rubble. However, a more elusive secret can be found later on in the title. One area of Sector 4 is particularly difficult to reach, and can only be accessed by using the Shine Spark. Once there, dialogue between a Federation official and Adam will unfold, praising the player for finding the location. The conversation concludes with the Federation official saying, I wonder how many players will see this message. One of Nintendo's best-known series is one which crosses over their entire backlog of games, the Super Smash Bros. franchise. This next secret actually appears throughout multiple Smash titles, starting with Melee and most recently appearing in Smash for Wii U. In each game, the texture for Ness's yo-yo has some tiny text on it that states the year of the game's release. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, the text says 2001. For Super Smash Bros. Brawl, it says 2008. And for Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U, it says 2014. Today we'll be looking at the games industry and the use of patents. In many ways, patents can be seen as a double-edged sword. Whilst their existence is to help prevent others from stealing designs and technology from creators, they can also restrict creativity and progress within various industries. Nintendo, for example, filed a patent in November of 2001, which incorporates both a phone handset and game controller into a single unit. This means that whilst the concept phone can be used like any normal handset, particularly in a time before touchscreens, it also allowed users easier control of gameplay with physical gameplay buttons, just like the N-Gage, you know how good that was. It took almost five years for this US patent to be granted to the console giant. Several diagrams were submitted alongside their claim and patent description demonstrating their concept. Whilst the idea is fairly obvious in design, mobile gaming was still in its infancy when the patent was filed, and certainly not the multi-billion dollar industry it is today. The iPhone, often considered to be the catalyst for the mobile gaming market wouldn't be announced for a whole six years after the Nintendo phone patent was filed. Today we'll be exploring trivia from a plethora of titles released on Nintendo's first true home console, the NES and Famicom. Despite a few technical hitches just after the Famicom's 1983 launch in Japan, its sales quickly picked up speed, becoming the best-selling console in the country by the end of the following year. Spurred on by the console's success, it wasn't long before the Western world was introduced to the Nintendo Entertainment System. The NES had a memorable lineup of launch games, including Ice Climber, Duck Hunt, and of course, Super Mario Bros. Some games released in both regions were changed during localization, such as the case of The Adventures of Bayou Bill known as Mad City in Japan. At the end of the game, after defeating the title's final boss, Billy's kidnapped girlfriend, Annabelle, is set free. In the game's Japanese release, it's possible to actually avoid Annabelle by simply walking around the screen without her touching you. By doing this for long enough, she will eventually ask whether Billy has come to despise her for having been kidnapped and putting him through so much trouble to save her. She will then tell Billy that they'll never see each other again before giving a final goodbye. This ending was cut when the game was localized for international releases along with two other endings. Completing the game on training mode will tell the player that they need to complete the game on normal difficulty to see the ending, and by holding up and select before the end dialogue appears, Annabelle will shy away from kissing Billy as she fears people might be watching. Another Japanese game with a curious ending is Erika to Satoru no Yume Balkan. After the game's normal ending has played through, the player is able to leave the game running in order to trigger a number of secrets. First, the photograph shown on screen will change to sepia. If the player then waits an additional 55 minutes, the game's music will stop. At this point, the player can press A, B, start, select and left on controller 1, and A, B, right on controller 2, and a new piece of music will start to play.
Then pressing B select and right on controller 1 and B right down on controller 2 will display a hidden message by programmer Hidamushi. The message goes into detail on Hidamushi's troubles during his time working on the title, besmirching those whom he had grievances with. It reads, First off, Kaoru Ogura, who ran off as some guy in the middle of the project, yes you, you bastard, don't show up at the office without showering after having sex six times the previous night. Next, Tetsuya Ahashi, yes you, you bastard, don't give me your flip and shit coming in late the day we ship the ROM like nothing's amiss. You can give me all the porn you want, I'm not forgetting that one, all that f weight you put on. No wonder you paid out 18,000 yen and still got nothing but a kiss out of it. Kenji Takano, Namco Debugger, you are a part-timer, don't dick around with the project planner. And finally, Kiaharu Goto, the biggest thorn in my side in this project, yes you, you bastard. Once I get a time machine, I'm sending you back to the Edo period. Go do your riddles over there. Ah, that's a load off. Wait, no it's not. Kiyoharu Gotu. Yes, you, you bastard. Ah, just disappear already. Hidemushi then goes on to thank his wife as well as several other people who assisted in development, even apologizing for his own behavior. After this message is complete, a second secret message can also be revealed by pressing A, B, and up on controller 1. The second message is an apology to the programmer's wife saying, Kazumushi, I'm sorry I didn't come home much. I love you and always have. Hidemushi. One of the biggest franchises to start on the NES is Nintendo's Zelda series. The first game was a learning experience for Nintendo and many small details about the game's development have been revealed over the years. Series creator Shigeru Miyamoto revealed in a 2016 interview that The Legend of Zelda was partly inspired by adventure movies such as Indiana Jones. Miyamoto said, the Indiana Jones movies were out around that time. I wanted to bring that sense of adventure to a video game. Another game series created by Miyamoto, Super Mario Bros., has some interesting inspirations as well. For example, the Cooper Kids, first seen in Super Mario Bros. 3, were all based on members of the game's design staff. Throughout Miyamoto's illustrious career, he has only had one game to not receive an American release, Devil World. The maze-based video game was released in 1984 in Japan, but due to Nintendo of America's stance on religious iconography in games, it never made it stateside. The game, however, was localized for Europe three years later and received a European Wii Virtual Console release in 2010. The protagonist of the game, a green dragon named Tamagon, appears as a trophy in the Japanese version of Super Smash Bros. Melee. However, this was removed in the US release. Despite not appearing in the final game, the trophy can still be found with action replay, including an English description. Another smash hit for the NES was Punch-Out! Pun intended. It was almost a decade before fans would see a sequel on the Super Nintendo, however there were plans for a sequel on the NES. This game would have been called Mike Tyson's Intergalactic Power Punch, but the plans for the game were changed after Tyson became embroiled in controversy surrounding sexual assault charges. The lead character of the game was renamed to Mark Tough Guy Tyler, though the appearance of the character was only slightly altered. The entire game was renamed to Power Punch 2, despite the fact there was never a Power Punch 1. In this episode of We Found Out Right After We Did The Actual Recording, in 2009, collector of rare prototype games, Jason Dream TR Wilson, told Nintendo Age users that not only did he have a prototype cart of Mike Tyson's intergalactic power punch, but that he would also be willing to release the ROM for the low price of $2,000. He eventually settled on $1,500 raised by more than 50 members of the community and released the ROM. Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest featured a reference to Hokotu no Ken, aka Fist of the North Star. Speaking to one of the people in Ondol, they will utter the line, If the Death Omen star is sighted, it's over. In the Fist of the North Star, if the Star of Death can be seen while two warriors battle, one of them is sure to die. This reference was clearly lost in the initial lackluster translation of the game, with the line being localized as, Don't look into the Death Star, or you will die. This is most likely due to the fact that Fist of the North Star wasn't popular in America at the time. Funnily enough, many Americans mistook the line for a reference to Star Wars and its Death Star. A game that never got its release anywhere outside of Japan was Metal Slater Glory. The adventure game spent four years in development, an entire year of which was spent planning director Yoshimiro Hoshi's ambitious vision. By the time the script was 80% complete, the team realized there was no chance of the entire game fitting on a Famicom cartridge. 
This in turn led them to cutting more than half of it. Despite this, Metal Slayer Glory is still one of the largest Famicom games ever produced at a whopping 8 megabits. The long development of the title meant that it was released only a short time before the Super Famicom went on sale, which is also likely why only 10,000 copies of the game were manufactured. This, in tandem with the game being one of the costliest to produce for the Famicom, and HAL Lab's gross overspending on advertising for the title, meant that it would be their final release as an independent company before filing for bankruptcy and being purchased by Nintendo. Yoshimiru did finally have his vision realised years later with Metal Slayer Glory Director's Cut. This final version of the game contains all the cut content planned for the original, as well as all new art and music. The director's cut was distributed through Nintendo Power Flash cartridges for the Super Famicom in November of the year 2000, making it the last ever officially released game for the system. In celebration of Animal Crossing New Horizons release on the Nintendo Switch, we're taking a look at the villager-centric life simulator. Fans of this series love it for the small moments and little details, so we're going to start with some small or sly references hidden within the series games. One of the newest obscure references in the series can be found in New Horizons. The character Gulliver is known for dropping references to big Nintendo franchises like Mario and Zelda in his dialogue. However, sometimes the character will give a sly nod to some lesser known gems in Nintendo's back catalogue. At one point while using a cell phone, Gulliver will say, I haven't gotten reception this sweet and bubbly since I washed up at old Coral Cola. This is a reference to the tropical village of the same name within Nintendo's tragically underrated 8-bit action adventure title, Star Tropics. The game is rarely referenced in Nintendo games, likely because it was never released in Japan. Another couple of little nods that can be found in this latest title are references to another huge Nintendo franchise, Splatoon. Keen members of the Splatoon subreddit have revealed that when fishing in New Horizons, upon catching a squid, the player may claim, I caught a squid, it's off the hook, a reference to Pearl and Marina from Splatoon, who go by the name Off the Hook. It's also possible the player will say, I caught a squid, I had an inkling I might. This is of course a reference to the humanoid squid hybrids from Splatoon, the Inklings. As we were just saying, part of Animal Crossing is about the details, like decorating your home. A recurring piece of decor that can be found in the series is the large space console. While the buttons and dials on it may seem randomly placed at first, there is actually a reference hidden in plain sight. On the far right of the console, there are four buttons arranged in a diamond shape, coloured blue, green, yellow and red. This is a nod to the Japanese Super Famicom and European Super Nintendo controllers, which had multicoloured Y, X, B and A buttons. Another reference in the series involves the now iconic gyroids. In the Japanese game, they're called Haniwa, after the terracotta figures of the same name that were made for ritual use and often buried with the dead. The reference we're talking about, however, is in their sales price. Gyroids are worth 828 bells. This could be a bit of fun Japanese wordplay, as in Japanese, 828 can be pronounced Haniwa, as the number 8 can sometimes be read as ha or wa. So, its sales price is essentially also its name in Japanese. As well as buying and selling, Animal Crossing bolsters its collection aspects by getting players to obtain some items exclusively through activities they can perform. This includes digging up fossils, which you can use to either decorate your house or, if you're feeling particularly generous, display them in the museum for your townsfolk to enjoy as well. The fossil of the mighty Seismosaur was first introduced in Wild World, and viewing it at a museum will prompt the curator and scholar Blathers the Owl to inform the player that the Seismosaurus is the longest of all known dinosaurs. However, the fossil was later renamed in New Leaf to correspond to the reclassification made by real-world paleontologists, who now believe that the sauropod remains were not actually evidence of a new genus, but more likely an abnormally large diplodocus. Nintendo's dedication to scientific accuracy is pretty darn impressive considering Animal Crossing's population of walking, talking cartoon animals. 
Animal Crossing as we know it today is steeped in culture on a global scale, with changes made to items and world events during localization to ensure that the game remained accessible to players outside of Japan. However, many uniquely Japanese aspects remain. For example, Dharma dolls are egg-shaped wishing dolls available to buy from Tom Nook's shop to furnish and decorate the player's home. They are also a direct reference to real-world Daruma dolls, symbols of good luck and perseverance. The mustachioed and monocled faces painted on the dolls represent the founder of Zen Buddhism, Bodhidharma, who practiced meditation and self-realization. Players will note that the eyes of Dharma dolls are blank when purchased, but interacting with them will fill in one eye. Traditionally given as a gift, real-world Daruma doll eyes are also blank when sold. The recipient then fills one eye when they undertake a goal, and then the other one once they have achieved it. Once both eyes are filled, the Daruma doll becomes a symbol of enlightenment and achievement. Dharma dolls as a furniture item adhere to the Animal Crossing's feng shui mechanics, increasing the player's luck if they're placed on the east side of a room. Placing a Daruma doll in your home promotes spiritual peace and becoming one with nature, which is fundamentally what Animal Crossing is all about. We mentioned on Did You Know Gaming before that Luna and her dream suite is a reference to the Baku or Dream Eater, but it seems Blanca, the genderless, faceless feline that appears sporadically throughout the series, is likely to join Luna in the roster of Animal Crossing characters based on Japanese folklore. Blanca is a trickster by nature and will take the form of existing villagers in their homes during New Leaf's April Fool's Day event, leaving players to guess which version is fake. This minigame mimics the behavior of the Noperabo, a faceless ghost that often uses its ability to disguise itself by impersonating someone familiar to the person who encounters it. Its facelessness can assist in its pranks. Character wardrobes are also afflicted by the occasional reference as well. One such clothing item was glimpsed in New Leaf's tourism trailer, the Team NTDO shirt that players could purchase in-game, NTDO being an abbreviation of Nintendo. This shirt is also emblazoned with the year 1889, which is the year Nintendo was first founded by Fusajiro Yamauchi in Kyoto, Japan. At this time, Nintendo was a small-time playing card company, and only began their shift into the toy and video game industry in the mid-60s. In the original Animal Crossing, a villager will tell the player that someone borrowed their Pokemon Pikachu and hasn't returned it, then requests that the player assume the role of a one-time Repo Man and take it back. This does not actually refer to the Pokemon itself, but rather Nintendo's own answer to the Tamagotchi, released in 1998 and featuring the electric mouse himself. Rather than encouraging the player to provide basic care for their virtual pet, the Pokemon Pikachu adopted Pokemon Yellow's progression of befriending Pikachu over time. The built-in pedometer would reward the player with watts every 20 steps, a currency used to buy Pikachu gifts and weirdly, to gamble with. Another reference can be found in Animal Crossing's music. The song KK Condor was originally named Peru no Uta, or Song of Peru in the Japanese games. This may have been changed to avoid referring to a real world country. Despite this, the piece sounds very similar to Song of the Condor, a traditional song of the Andean people who lived in what is now Peru. <laughs> One of the lesser known pieces of Animal Crossing software is the Animal Crossing Calculator DSiWare and eShop app. Although the app isn't much more than just a calculator, it does contain a few easter eggs of its own. If the user enters an equation and the result is a sequential number, such as 1, 2, 3, 4, Tom Nook and some flowers will appear from the bottom of the screen after the player presses equals. And if the resulting number contains the same digits, such as 777, Nook and a corresponding number of balloons will float up from the bottom of the screen. For every iconic Nintendo game like Super Mario 64, Super Metroid, or Pokemon Red and Blue, there's a horde of rumored Nintendo games that never actually existed. And while many of these rumored games can be boiled down to someone telling a lie on a message board, some of them have more interesting backstories. In this video, we'll be talking about a few of the more interesting and eccentric rumored Nintendo games. Some that were completely made up, some that were half-truths, and some that 
may have actually existed, but can't be proven. And since Metroid Dread recently released on the Switch, we thought we'd start this video off right with a few rumored Metroid games. At E3 2017, Nintendo dropped a bit of a bombshell during their presentation. Metroid Prime, a sub-series that many thought had come to a close, was suddenly revived with a tease of Metroid Prime 4 for the Nintendo Switch. And if that wasn't enough, a few hours later Nintendo revealed that Metroid 2 was being remade for the 3DS by Mercury Steam. Fans knew that a Prime 4 release was still years off, and that Samus Returns was coming later that year. This drummed up a lot of speculation about what Nintendo might do to fill the gap between the two games, if at all. It seemed like a no-brainer that Nintendo would port the Metroid Prime trilogy to the Switch, and this was understandably a recurring rumor following the Prime 4 announcement. However, some leakers and rumor mongers went a step further than this, believing Nintendo had another remake in the works. In November 2019, a group of leakers named Leaky Pandy, who was previously been called Vandal Leaks, tweeted, Nintendo is planning two new Metroid titles that will release in the next two fiscal years respectively. One is a re-release of Metroid Prime Trilogy HD, the second one is a Super Metroid remake that mimics Samus Returns in style and scope. While many were excited for a potential Super Metroid remake on Switch, others were more skeptical. A remake of Samus Returns on 3DS made a lot of sense. Metroid 2 would probably age the worst out of all the Metroid titles, and would benefit from a remake. Super Metroid however, is still beloved and played by millions regularly to this day, and clearly wouldn't benefit as much from a remake. Some also pointed at the spotty history of Leaky Pandy's rumors. Although the group had correctly predicted a date for an August 2018 Nintendo Direct, and that gameplay for Travis Strikes Again would feature single Joy-Con co-op gameplay, many of their other predictions didn't come true, like Mario Odyssey getting a new Luigi's Mansion-based kingdom with a new 43 stars, and as the old saying goes, a broken clock is right twice a day. A new 2D Metroid was announced nearly a year and a half later as Metroid Dread, but the likelihood of the rumor and Dread being connected seems low. And this isn't the only rumored Metroid game we're talking about today. In September 2011, Metroid Database posted a scan from a 1998 issue of Germany's Club Nintendo magazine. Club Nintendo seemed to be featuring a screenshot from a Game Boy Color version of Metroid 2, which fans have come to call Metroid 2 DX, in the same vein as Link's Awakening DX. Interestingly, the page never mentions Metroid by name, and it's not clear if the image is real or some kind of mock-up. The user who sent the scan to Metroid Database, Prime Blue, said that Club Nintendo rarely made mock-ups for games and tended to only use official material, but there are several factors that indicate the image may be a mock-up and not a screenshot of an actual game. One of the reasons is that the alleged Metroid 2 DX image depicted an entirely new area not found in Metroid 2, and used a combination of enemies that can't be found in the game either. Comments from developers don't seem to back up the image either. In a 1998 interview, Nintendo of America localizer Dan Ausen didn't seem to recall the game existing, and just mentioned that the Game Boy Color had a Metroid palette built in. When asked about a Game Boy Color re-release of Metroid 2, Ausen said, Since R&D 1 was involved in the development of Game Boy Color, I think they were able to put a special Metroid palette in the GBC hardware. This makes Metroid 2 look really, really nice on Game Boy Color. The game was also never listed as in development by Nintendo Power. Series developer Yoshio Sakamoto also stated that no Metroid titles were developed for the Game Boy Color because the system's limitations were closer to the original Nintendo. Any handheld Metroid game would have been technically very inferior to Super Metroid, and therefore would be compared to it unfavorably. Our next rumored Nintendo game is a little more recent, and will leave you thinking about what could have been. In June 2015, gaming historian and Did You Know Gaming collaborator Liam Robertson posted a video on his YouTube channel talking about a potential F-Zero title on the Wii U. Liam had been tipped off that Criterion Games was asked by Nintendo of Europe if the studio had any interest in working on the F-Zero IP. Criterion are responsible for the Burnout series, as well as several well-received entries in the Need for Speed franchise. Given the studio's familiarity with high-octane racers, it's understandable why Nintendo might approach them with an offer to work on F-Zero. Liam set out to see if he could confirm the rumor, and reached out to former vice president and creative director of Criterion Games, Alex Ward. Ward confirmed that the rumor was true, and that in early 2011, someone at Nintendo of Europe asked Criterion about doing an F-Zero game for the Wii U. 
At the time, Criterion was developing Need for Speed Most Wanted and wasn't available for any new projects, and Nintendo wanted the game in production ASAP, with another source telling Liam that Nintendo wanted to show F-Zero off at the Wii U's unveiling at E3 2011. By the time Liam posted his video, it'd been over a decade since the last F-Zero title was released. Fans were clamoring for any news on the franchise, which led to several news sites picking up Liam's report, but many of them seem to have gotten the report completely wrong. Several outlets embellished the story, saying that an F-Zero title had been in development for the Wii U, but was cancelled. But the project, if you can even call it that, was never even formally pitched. This led to Ward playing down the rumors on the Game Informer show, where he said that the Nintendo representative who reached out to him about F-Zero was very junior, and implied this rep wouldn't have been able to even arrange a pitch. For our next rumored game, we're going back in time again to an era where gaming rumors mainly came from magazines. One magazine that was quick to report rumors back in the day was Electronic Gaming Monthly. In their gaming gossip section, EGM's Quarterman would report a handful of rumors from the industry in every issue, and one of these rumors told of a brand new Mario and Donkey Kong game coming to the Super Nintendo. They went on to talk about how the game was a 16-bit remake of the arcade version of Donkey Kong with new scenes and better graphics. Although we've mentioned this rumor in a previous episode, what we didn't mention was EGM's follow-up over a year later. According to the outlet's June 1993 issue, the Mario and Donkey Kong title got further into development, but was quote, placed on the Philips CDI and Super Famicom CD platforms. EGM also said the title was slated to come out sometime in the following year, which is notably optimistic for a game that was never released. That said, some part of this rumor may be true. Back in 1992-93, a company called RSP was developing games for the Super Super Nintendo and Philips CDI. This was a USA-based independent studio founded by Atari's Mike Rydell, who'd worked on titles like Spy vs. Spy and Commando. Another staffer at RSP was Adrian Jackson Jones, who worked as a Super Nintendo and CDI programmer. Although Adrian only spent a year at RSP, he'd later add a curious game to his resume. According to Adrian, he designed and implemented the game engine for the CDI system game Donkey Kong. The fact that RSP was working on both Super Nintendo and CDI titles and reportedly developed a DK CDI game around 1993, the same time frame as the rumor, could mean EGM's rumor was legit. And while we're talking about Donkey Kong, we might as well talk about another rumored DK title. One 8-bit Nintendo game, Return of Donkey Kong, is a unique example of a title that may just be a rumor, but could potentially be an unreleased project. In 1987, the official Nintendo Player's Guide listed an upcoming title in their coming attractions section as Return of Donkey Kong, the fourth installment of the arcade series where you'd get a hold of that barrel-throwing, mischief-making rascal and take control. Months later in the March 1988 issue of Nintendo Fun Club, Nintendo's official newsletter from the 80s, a similar preview was made, hinting at the idea of Donkey Kong becoming a playable character. Despite being name-dropped in print on multiple occasions, there's no proof of whether the game existed or not. Several Nintendo employees such as spokesperson Howard Phillips and executive VP Don James have no memory of the game when asked about it. In addition to this, no screenshots of the game in action have yet to surface. A 1997 issue of the British N64 magazine claimed that Return of Donkey Kong was completed, but gave no sources to back it up, so take that with a grain of salt. Did you also know that there's over 30 Mario video games that America never got, or that there's a cancelled Zelda game for the DS that no one had ever heard of until a few weeks ago? For more on those, click or tap one of the videos on screen, and thanks for watching.